All right. Well, let's let's get going. So uh, in the next hour and a half, we've got a ton of goodies for you. Um, firstly, Claire Donna, uh, my wonderful, knowledgeable colleague from More Onion, is going to talk about improving performance of your Facebook ads and landing pages for um, mobilization or uh, giving, um, attracting more volunteers, whatever you want to do, whatever form of giving you're talking about, whether it's time or money, um, Claire knows how to optimize it. So, uh, and then, then I'll be talking about recent wins from clients who have discovered their very own giving code. And then we're going to wrap up the day with a little fun experiment, uh, which will be networking for introverts. So, um, if, if you're an extrovert like me, you're already incredibly well served with networking and introverts kind of just have to flounder because uh, they're not, not built for the kind of networking events that we extroverts love. So we're going to try something uh, a little bit different and hopefully it sets up some really nice connections in a way that you don't often get online. So uh, that will be, uh, oh, we're going to have it between Claire's uh, little presentation and mine, we're going to have a, a little break, about five minutes, so that people can um, have a smoke break or a, a tipple uh, or whatever you need to refresh your brain. Um, so uh, some of you know me very well already, some of you uh, you you might be wondering who is this person calling herself the donor whisperer. Um, so I've I've worked with nonprofits from all over the globe for over twenty years, well over twenty years now, like twenty four five old, um, from huge, absolutely giant nonprofits to tiny, and um, listed here are just some of the three hundred plus that I've helped to grow. And I specialize in helping social enterprises, campaigns and causes uh, to grow using digital media. So now I'd like to know about you. Uh, actually, both uh, uh, Claire and Danny from More Onion and myself would all like to know more about you. So please, in the chat, could you tell us uh, your job title? And which organization you work for, if any, you might work for yourself or you might just be starting up a nonprofit. Um, that's it's totally up to you whether you want to reveal your organization. And then please also tell us what your favorite emoji is. And uh, I'll I'll kick things off. It's that favourite hippo emoji. That's excellent. Um, oh, a parrot emoji. I love it. Um, good old fashioned standard smiley. Yeah. I like I like all of these very much. The rolling on the floor laughing emoji. It's got to be a classic. Oh, the, the, the swearing emoji. <laughs> Um, oh, we have a curveball taco. I've not seen that uh, as anyone's favorite emoji yet. Oh, and the koala. Yes, cute animals always win. Favorite emoji, much joy. <laughs> okay, 
if you if you haven't told us your favorite emoji yet uh please feel free to keep thinking and just post in the chat when it occurs to you uh, meantime we'll move on and i will hand over to claire donna who is the mobilization expert at uh, pan-european agency more onion who i've collaborated with occasionally over the last two decades and are totally amazing and you should work with them uh so yeah um here we go thanks rachel i'm just going to share my screen with you one second can you see that okay perfect okay just get my notes up all right great hi everybody uh so Hi, as Rachel said, I'm Claire, and I'm also joined on the call by my colleague Danny and Jess. As there's three of us here today, uh, Danny and I will be answering your questions after this presentation. So, a uh, short presentation for you today, but I'm also going to be signposting some resources. So, there's lots of free resources out there that can help you if you wanted to dive into more detail in one part of this or more parts of what I'm going to talk through today. The focus is going to be finding attracting new supporters uh, with a focus on fundraising. So this is uh, obviously really important for every organization to sustain their support base. Even if they're not looking to grow, you need to, of course, be attracting new people. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on Facebook as a channel because it's just one of the main places right now. And I think it has an awful lot of potential for you to do experimenting and, and scaling and really growing your uh, financial program. So quick introduction. Hello. As I say, um, myself and Danny will be taking your questions today. Danny is a fellow mobilization expert at More Onion. She's also really expert at using Meta and Facebook, um, which I confess I'm not. I hate Facebook. Um, it's really useful, really valuable, but um, the back end of it makes me very sad. So Danny's expertise will be absolutely invaluable for us here as well. So we are a digital mobilization agency and we work exclusively with charities and not-for-profits. We work, as Rachel said, across Europe and that includes the UK, the, uh, the, the continent of Europe. Um, and we work to help people to improve their support communications, anything to do with mobilization, whether that's fundraising, campaigning, improving your audience relationships, everything involved within that and the integration of them. So we do a range of things for consultancy and project delivery through to design that's really action focused. It's not just pretty, but it's pretty and actually helps you achieve your goals. And we have a campaigning and fundraising platform called Impact Stack. So Impact Stack can be used for any, any of the donation forms you could wish for, as well as a range of campaigning uh, functionality from basic stuff like petitions through to matching you with geographical targets like local councillors, MPs, etc. So that's enough of us. Um, we work with, although <laughs> just to say, we do have a tiny and huge organization. So our perspective here is, is quite wide ranging. So we have some clients who are one of the biggest in the UK. We have some that are multi-country and we have some that are really small. So we understand the different needs and requirements of that scale. So although today we're going to be looking at a case study that's on the slightly larger end of the scale, that doesn't mean that the what we're going to go through doesn't apply to your organization. All right. So I want to talk you through the three steps that I think are really critical to designing and executing a recruitment strategy. Now, in just 15 minutes, of course, we're not going to go into a huge amount of depth on each of them. Hopefully, this is enough for you to get started thinking about where are we in this process, what bits are we missing, and what's our next opportunity. So recruiting the right supporters requires a robust strategy. This is, of course, always true. Everything you do should have a great strategy behind it, and it's one of the things that we just mentioned constantly because it really cannot be overstated. You need to know what success looks like for you in order for you to achieve it. Next up is creative work. So coming up with lots of ideas for ways you can try some things you can then actually explore which of them work rather than just using the default and assuming that there's no better out there. And then testing and optimization. So making sure what you're doing, you are doing as well as you can and that you're reviewing and improving upon that. So let's start with step one with the strategy. When we're talking about strategy, of course, the key part of this is really good objectives and good metrics to measure their success. And you want to be considering not just the project that you're working on right now, but the broader audience objectives. So instead of saying, 
we need more signatures for this petition or we need more income for this specific Christmas appeal and then getting new supporters in. You want to think about what that lifetime of those supporters is so you can make sure you're maximizing that value and you're growing your organization and your fundraising stability in the long term. So you need to be asking yourself, what are our supporters for? Really big question. We're not going to dive into audience strategy today, but if you can't answer this question, do have a proper think about it and maybe revisit and spend some time with your colleagues on it. You then want to think about how do our supporters help us achieve our organization's vision and how will the project that you're thinking about now, so the project to recruit new fundraisers or new supporters, how will this help us on that path? So we're going to focus in on this last question here. So we're going to focus on project specific objectives and goals and deliverables. So example recruitment project objectives could include things such as building sustainable individual giving program something that funds itself, that, that grows year on year so that you get more income, you can build your, your program of work, whatever that may be. It might be to build support for your campaigns, again, in the broad sense, rather than one specific campaign. It might be to attract event participants. There's a huge list of things here. But you need to know what yours are for your particular project. Otherwise, you cannot get closer to success. Once you've got all that core stuff in place, it's time to get creative. I know this is something that some people are a bit uncomfortable with, but I assure you, whoever you are, whatever your role, there are ways you can get creative and you can come up with new ideas in a way that doesn't feel painful. It can be fun. It can be interesting. And I, I definitely encourage giving this a go if it's not something you do a lot at the moment. So you want to make sure you're taking your time and you're coming up with lots of ideas. So actions that people can take to join you to become a supporter and framing so why people would support each of those actions. When I say an action, this could be literally anything from a simple sign up form to a donation form or something a bit more creative. So whether that be a quiz or a resource offering or something like that. These are ways that you can collect consent to contact people, which allows you to build relationships, to make them supporters and to build that sustainable income with them. Today, I'm going to be focusing a lot on what I call um, lead lead magnets, I guess. There's like four or five different phrases for them, but actions that are not, a, not directly going into a donation page, but rather they're a different type of sign-up form that then later in the relationship will build um, the opportunity to get people to give money and that kind of stuff. So uh, for example, if someone were to sign a petition first and then you maybe ask them for money later, that would be a lead magnet. So there's a few examples of what this can look like. So you can have um, hand raise action. You can offer resources. You can have a simple sign up. You can have some kind of pledge action. There's loads of things you can consider here. But the important thing is that you take the time to work out what ideas work for you because every organization will be unique here. I really recommend, if you're not sure where to start, get yourself some books. There's some fantastic ones out there. Uh, these are the two that I use most regularly. In fact, they're actually both within arm's reach of me right now. Um, these talk you through creative processes. They give you practical exercises that you can go through with your group or alone, whatever that may be, to work out, you know, what are the ideas for us that are, that are going to be effective. Once you come up with your ideas, you're then selecting them. So we recommend selecting between three to five actions that people can take. So this is the type of form that you're creating for them to collect consent. And then within that, you want to create three to five framings per action. So three to five different ways you can describe the same thing. So if, for example, if you had a, a petition about saving a rainforest. You could frame that about saving the animals in the rainforest. You could frame that about the environmental impact of preserving the rainforest. There are loads of different ways that you can frame the same action. So consider that and think about how you can pitch that to slightly different values and slightly different audiences. So now you've got your actions and you know what they're trying to achieve, so you know how to measure it. We can then move into a testing and optimization phase. So the first thing is measuring that, so the metrics for the objectives that you've chosen. These are going to depend so much on what you're looking to achieve, but I want to just share some common ones here so we can dig a little bit deeper. So common metrics that people use for recruitment adverts are things like cost per lead. So this is how much you spend per new opted in supporter. So for every person who you didn't have the permission to contact before, you can now send them an email or you can post something to them or you can phone them. You can define that as you wish, but generally speaking, cost per lead is email consent. 
You then have early engagement indicators. These are things like uh, if somebody gives us consent to email, are they opening the first few emails we send them? Are they taking the first few actions we give them? Are they getting involved? Are they giving money on a thank you page? So these things that give you an indication of whether the person who's given you consent to contact is going to be a long term success for you for your goal. So if we're looking to recruit long term donors, an early indicator of success and engagement would be thank you page donations or early early donation in a welcome journey, say in the first three months. And then, of course, you also might consider things like initial donation value. So I want to just use this table to show you why having the right metrics is so important and knowing which ones to pay attention to. Your metrics have to be closely tied to your objective. Otherwise, you can accidentally make bad decisions and chase the wrong thing. So in this example, we have uh, channel one and channel two. This, is also, this could be um, action one and action two. This could be framing one, framing two, whatever, whatever your variants are here. And we see in the columns that we have 10,000 people signing up for one and 6,000 for two. So if we're measuring signups, channel one has one. If we're measuring cost per signup, channel one is 40p, whereas channel two is pounds. So channel one wins again. Um, so knowing what your, your, um, your primary metric here is really critical because, as you'll see if you look further down at the table, the number of people becoming a donor at the six-month point, channel two actually comes in and wins there. So by measuring the right thing, which in this case would be cost per donor or would be a uh, long term return on, on investment on these supporters, you would know that actually by going with channel two or action two, whatever it may be you're testing here, that that is more effective, even though the cost per sign up is slightly higher. So knowing what you're measuring allows you to pivot and to adapt appropriately. If you measured wrong in this example, you would end up chasing supporters that ultimately weren't going to become donors for you. So I wanted to share with you a real case study. Um, we've, we're, we're calling them anonymous. This is because we want to use real numbers. So we want to tell you exactly what they were getting before, exactly the results they were getting afterwards. And of course, it's, it's challenging for charities to sign off specific spend. So this is how we're sharing the information with you by anonymizing it. They are a real UK organization. They are, I would say, medium sized. So before the project began, so we worked with them, we've been working with them for just over a year now, and we're, we're continuing to do so. They were finding before the project that they were getting quite a high cost per new lead, very high, really, at £7.84. So this was the benchmark we had for what they were getting from their previous approaches. And we wanted to just absolutely crush this because this is, this is very high for a new supporter. So we started with the objective which for this organization was to boost long-term digital fundraising income. So they very much have a view on that long-term, that you know, two-year, three-year, five-year, 10-year, making the organization stronger and more sustainable going forward. They weren't looking for a quick flash in the pan. So then with this, what we did is we developed four lead generation actions, these lead magnets. One of them was a petition, two hand raises, i.e. sign this form if you agree with our statement kind of a, you know, like I'm in kind of actions. And one was a simple sign up, you know, join our email list. We then, for the testing methodology, for these four actions, we had three to five angles and framings per action. We then had five images per framing, five headlines per framing, five ad pieces of ad copy per framing. It ends up looking a little bit like this. So this is a simplified diagram. But just to give you a sense of what I mean by these different tests. So you can see here, the petition had five framings. A hand raiser had three, a hand raiser had three. We end up having, we had over 100 ad tests for this going at once. So we had about five being tested for each action. So there's all these different stages of testing. We're seeing which image and which framing works best for this petition. Okay, and how does it work for this hand raiser and how do they compare to one another? By having all these variants, it allows you to identify and improve upon the, the performance, but also to get longer term learnings. So let's zoom in on the first one. So the petition one here, make that a little bit bigger. So as I said, there's about 25 ads that were launched just here. And we have these five framings. I'm going to share the results for you in a second. So we would review what you do. It's really important to keep an eye on Facebook ads when they're live. So if some of them are not performing well, you can turn them off. If some are performing well, you can create more variants that are in that theme. 
So if you notice a particular type of image is working well for you, you might create a couple more ads with variations of that image, and you might turn off the one that's not working for you. So over time, it should build. So the ads that you launch with and the action that you launch with should be the worst results you see. Because the point is, launch is the beginning. Iteration and improvement and optimization means that you're only going to keep going up. So it's very much worth investing and making sure that you consider launch to be the beginning, not the end of your project. So what we saw here is uh, this is our framings broken down and the cost per opted in supporter. This is for opt in for email. And you can see that already the prices, even for the worst performing ones, are significantly better than we were seeing for uh, the pre project numbers. Even the individual stories, which here was 88p, the most expensive one, is still doing well. This is because of the optimization methodology, but also because we applied best practice, of course, before we started the testing. So looking at this, we have a cost per opt-in, but is that the only metric we want to have? So we want to make sure that we're getting not just supporters at a good price, but we're getting the right supporters. That's really important. You could get tens of thousands of people really cheaply that are completely useless to you. So you want to make sure that you're reviewing and, and checking that those are the sort of people that actually do support are likely to do things that will help us achieve our long-term objectives. So in this case, becoming donors. So we have this extra column here, which is um, the column is return on ad spend. But of course, you'd, you'd be reviewing more specifically the uh, percentage you were giving and the average gift. This is just a, a quicker way of displaying that. So in this example, you can see that they actually correspond very closely. So the cost per, per opt-in and the return on ad spend is pretty close. There are some cases where this isn't always true. So you might have people who cost quite a lot to recruit, but they do pay off really well. So you want to make sure you have those columns, you have that data that you're reporting on so that you're investing properly. This was just phase one of the project. So the results that we saw for this phase one was that, as I said before, we were almost eight, eight pounds per lead. During this stage one, it was 50p per lead was the average cost per new lead. This is the beginning of a project, which means that going forward, we can take the learnings from this and we can apply them. So we can build upon this. And that's the really critical thing. I want to really briefly say a few things about landing page testing, and then I'll signpost you to some resources. With your landing pages, they matter just as much as the ads, because if you have fantastic ads, they go to a bad landing page. You could be doubling, tripling your cost per acquisition. So you want to make sure that they're sharp. Start with the basics. If you're not sure what those are, there's a free report for you. I'll give you a link in a second. Um, what you want to make sure that you're doing is you're looking at your funnel. So your weak spots are going to be different for each organization. So when I'm talking about funnel, this probably is really obvious. I know this is quite a common marketing thing, but just to say, you might be looking at page visitors, how many people click through on the ad, how many people complete the form, how many then opt in for contact, how many maybe make a donation on the thank you page, and how many you can then build a long-term relationship with. You can then look for those weak spots within that funnel. For example, um, if we have this, uh, people clicking on the ad, completing the form, opt in, donate, Donate again. If this is our funnel, from this, you can see that there's a, there's a really clear point where it's underperforming. That opt-in here, way too low. But by seeing that's our weak spot and addressing that first, we can have this cascading effect on everything below. So even if we're not changing our donation ask, we're not changing our um, journeys or anything like this, just by optimizing this point here, everything below it cascades and gets better. So you have to look at your funnels. What are your numbers? And, and consider how you can optimize those weak spots. In terms of what that looks like, this is just an example of how you might optimize your opt-ins. So this is a test that we ran quite a few years ago now, around the time of GDPR, so I guess uh, 2018, uh, where we were exploring whether checkbox or radio buttons are better for opt-in rates. In this instance, a checkbox got an average of 15%, 1.5 opt-in rate, whereas the radios was more like 50, 5, 0 opt-in rate. So this is how you can run simple tests and improve the, uh, the weak spots in your funnel. If you want to start testing, you're not sure where, um, again, for some free resources, if you go to moreonion.com forward slash free dash reports, you can download loads of free materials, including a report on optimizing day, optimization testing and on optimizing web forms. You should be testing and optimizing all of your forms, but also then the, the emails that people get. 
There's a broader range of reports available for you if you go to the free reports page, including one called Recruiting New Supporters, which goes into more depth and more steps than I've been able to cover today and I hope will be really valuable for you. Just to mention a couple more resources before I step off. Um, we are running a, our training program, our popular training program, again in February next year. This has two parts. The first training is on supporter recruitment. So that is a full two mornings where we go through more depth of how to find and recruit the right supporters, how to see if it's working and how to improve upon your performance. Uh, the second training is supporter journeys. So how to communicate with supporters you have whether that's welcome journeys or journeys to your existing supporters. And I wanna promote one last thing. There is a fantastic conference coming up next year called Impact Space. This is gonna be happening in April. It's gonna be in a really cool venue in Amsterdam. Um, do come along, join us there. Uh, I think Rachel, you've already signed up if I recall. Um, it's gonna be a two day conference. You sign, uh, scan the QR code or visit impact-space.org. There's also uh, an online event for that in advance and afterwards, but it's going to be really cool in person. If you can join us, please do come along. That's all from me today. Um, I will take questions if anybody has some, and also Danny is here to answer some more technical questions if you have some. Rachel, do we have any questions? You're muted. Oh, <laughs> today of all days, I make the classic schoolgirl error. Um, so, yeah, we don't have any questions so far. Um, but uh, ah, okay, we do. We have one now. Um, uh, John Nutt uh, from the Campaign Against the Arms Trade asks, uh, "What were the two books you recommended?" So one is called Game Storming. I'll give you some links in the chat as well. And the other is Idea Agent. They are both excellent. I will pop the links in the chat for you for uh, the Goodreads links. And uh, I'm going to do a classic <laughs> plug here. Because uh, there's a, <laughs> there is a, uh, a bit on um, brainstorming um, creative sign-up mechanisms or lead magnets or irresistible lures uh, in the giving code on page page 162 and um there's uh it's easy to find because there's a particularly uh particularly interesting page of um sub email subject lines um including one that says oily filth which i thought was a great one um and some, uh, one that was uh, not very complimentary about Donald Trump, uh, but yeah, you'll have a laugh if you uh, if you read those. Um, but yeah, the same brainstorming um, technique that I list in the book works for um, uh, the uh, lead magnets uh, or, or anything anything you want really. Um, but uh, it's obviously a, a loads loads more and much more in-depth stuff in the book that claire recommends if you really want to get deeply into the creative process okay another question uh you mentioned about form testing what variants would you create on a donate form to test what an excellent question oh this is something i'm actually getting stuck into right now for a client i love a bit of form testing um so it depends on your form so the first thing to do is review your form i'd recommend look at some um donation forms of the big big charities so ones that you know have had budget and have done some testing themselves see what the differences are between theirs and yours and you might initially just make some changes but then you might think actually is this working for our audience is this not those are your tests you could test things like donation amounts you could test things about the amount and the layout of the fields that you use you could test the images on the page the copy on the page um, you could test the opt-in is obviously really critical it really depends what you're optimizing for um, one of the things that one of our clients has found works really well for them they've reversed the order of their prompt values so they have the higher ones first and the lower ones later and they found that that helped to increase the average gift amount so it depends what you're trying to do with the, with the form if you're trying to just get people to take the action you might have different things to test than if you're trying to increase the average gift amount or if you're trying to increase the number of people who check the, the gift aid box 
Um, but I, I say that the first point is think about what, um, how close you are to best practice. And if you feel like there's a few steps to take, take those first. So look at competitors and have a look at that report. And then you can think about how you optimize around the things that you're looking for. Hope that helps. And Danny, thank you for answering that question in the chat. So Danny's just answered uh, the question, do you find Facebook is the best platform for recruiting supporters? Danny said, it depends on who you are trying to recruit, but for the typical audience, we tend um, to chase as charities. Yes, it is. One of the other great things about Facebook is that the sheer scale of it allows you to do some really robust testing. So you can try different mechanisms, different framings and learn a lot from it as well as getting the leads. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have so far, but if there are, um, Claire and Danny will be around for uh, until half past three, so um, if you have any more questions that come to mind, just pop them in the chat and mention who, which, which person they're for. Um, because there's a lot of there is a lot of overlap between our respective knowledge and um so yeah uh and we'll 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 come back again to Claire just in case there are more questions for her or Danny uh, towards the end um before we do the networking um okay uh we have a question from Carl uh, if you've never done any online donation requesting where do you begin um, oh, I'd need to ask you about five questions to even answer that. Do you mean, do you already have an existing supporter base, Carl? Are you talking about how to do fundraising from them? Or are you talking about how to recruit new supporters to fundraise from? Um, we have a very, just a handful of existing donors. We don't, we don't particularly have a strong relationship with them in terms of dialogue. It's something we need to do. So we, we are really at, at the beginning knowing we should do more and better yeah. and want to start and want to apply good practice, but yeah. Cool. I mean, the first step there really critically is thinking about your audience and you know the, the questions at the beginning, like what are your audience for? So um, how do your donors engage with the topic? Who are, you know, who would, what sort of people would be likely to become donors with you? And understanding how your relationship with them and the organization would be and what you're offering for them and what, what that kind of reci reciprocity would be, uh, I think is really important. So don't, I would say, don't just run out and spend money on ads. I think take some time and think about how many supporters do we need? What type of supporters do we need? What do we need to, to offer them, to communicate with them, to get them interested in, in our work would be my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I think we're going to take a five minute break. So if we actually let's let's make it seven minutes because otherwise it's not going to be a pleasantly even time uh, for my weird brain. So um, if we reconvene at two thirty five, and we'll dive into the 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 next presentation, which is from me about recent wins from clients who unlocked their giving code.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for waiting patiently for this, and I hope you had a good, a good break. Um, so let me share my screen again, and I'm going to walk you through some recent wins from clients who unlocked their giving code. Before I dive in, um, I just want to put across as strongly as I can that the clients that uh, the, the results that my clients get are atypical uh, in the same way as uh, the more onions clients get extraordinary results. The nonprofits that you're going to hear about just now are just as extraordinary. And the only way to get the same results as all of these people we're talking about is to be just as courageous. Uh, my my mum, bless her, always said to me while I was growing up, if you don't go out on a limb, you won't pick the fruit. And it's a horrible old cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. And what could be better than uh, a nice, juicy, ripe, organic new fruit that you've picked by hand? So uh, I want to ask if this sounds a bit like you and where you are at the moment. Uh, do you slave over fundraising peels or campaigns for weeks and you find that they barely pay for themselves? Um, do you risk hundreds of hours on new ways to grow your email list or your direct mail list or even your telephone fundraising list and you that you see them perform poorly and you don't know why? Are you feeling overwhelmed by all this continually changing digital media stuff? Uh, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, influencers, Twitch, Telegram, YouTube, contactless payments, Patreon, Giving Tuesday, Facebook groups, augmented reality, Pinterest, Discord, chat, GPT. You're spinning so many plates already and you feel like screaming, stop. I never want to see another screen. Do you worry that your cause will come out of this cost of living crisis much worse off than you went in? And do you wake up every morning stressing about how to make payroll for the next six months? Does it feel like you'll be stuck at your current size forever, scrimping and saving and firefighting, never growing enough to reach all the people or animals who need your help? I have a big question for you. Do you feel like no matter what you do, you just can't reach the people who really care about your cause. And the real problem here is that you haven't yet found your giving code. Once you find it, you'll be able to go from spending every waking hour thinking about how to save money to plotting how to expand. And you can sleep easier knowing the future of your charity is secure. So, where this comes from is that over the course of my work running a web agency that specialized in nonprofits and then into my journey as after I sold the, that web agency and then into my journey as a consultant, I noticed that some charities were staying stuck or even worse, having to lay off staff or cancel projects to survive, whereas some were growing rapidly and doubling or even trebling their online income each year. And if you've read the Giving Code book, you might recognize this graph comparing two nonprofits that were um, campaigning on a very similar cause um, to do with democracy. And um, the blue one started at nearly a million pound income per year. The red one started um, in uh, 1995. I think I believe the blue one had been going for a few years prior to that, since the late 80s, uh, and um, the the red one had just just begun around the mid 90s, um, with uh, considerably less turnover of about 10,000 pounds a year, and um, I'm sorry, that's that's nine, you know, it's nine hundred thousand pounds a year, and that the, the bottom, the red one, is a hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, and 
I uh, over the years they swapped places until the um, 2008 when the uh, the red nonprofit suddenly exploded in income growth. The blue one uh, had had a long slow decline and again grew a little bit, but not by much in comparison. Uh, and so yes, the the red nonprofit had a, a commensurate fall in income. Um, but it's still much, much rather be the red nonprofit than the blue nonprofit. And having seen both of these organizations up close, I started to think, well, what, what is the difference between them? And uh, I wrote the giving code to try and explain that difference and uh, how you can actually learn from the nonprofits like the uh, the red one, um, and uh, turn things around so that you're not you're not at risk of bumbling along the bottom or experiencing that slow decline. Um, once you find your giving code, uh, then you can you can experience that level of explosive growth. Um, so the the first step in uh, the, the the journey to unlock your giving code is to get to know your very best donors to figure out what their demographics are, what their values and motivations are, and then to test those findings scientifically at scale. So that then, uh, like this photo shows, you could just pinpoint your potential donor in a crowd of people and know that's the person that I need to ask. And to do that, you need to understand what the right, uh, the right audience is to uh, the right pond to go fishing in, so to speak. You need to understand what the right message is to give to that audience. And you need to understand the right channel, where to put out that message. Um, so take Transform Justice, for example. Um, they When they came to me, they had a list of just over 900 supporters um for their campaign their fair checks campaign um which uh, aims to prevent people from being locked out of financial services and jobs for life purely by having a, a criminal justice record a criminal record i mean and so um i helped them to find the right audience and the right message to reach that audience and the result was that they grew to over 5,000 supporters in year two. And um, more recently, they um, they ran the process to find their giving code again so that they could get more volunteers. And they actually, they genuinely had the experience of getting more volunteers than they could handle uh, for their court watch project. So uh, it was once once they realized that um, the the values of their very best donors were very different to the kind of values they've been appealing to in the past, then that just unlocked things for them. And the way they talked about their cause completely changed and their um, their growth completely changed as well. So step two is to find your irresistible lure. And uh, that's uh, my particular term for uh, what Claire called um, lead magnets, uh, also known as sign-up mechanisms. Basically, you need one of these that goes on working while you sleep, um, one that you can um, promote via digital ads or even stick up on church notice boards or school notice boards it doesn't have to be digital it can be a physical sign up mechanism um but it's it's one that you can put out there and have sign ups coming continually because they're attracted by the um the message and what you have to offer them um, that chimes with their values so as an example of this um i worked with Grace Alzheimer's Research, and they were really stuck. They were in a situation where they were not experiencing any growth at all. 
Um, they didn't know what to do or where to start. And um, they were finding that just, you know, putting stuff on, on Facebook day after day just wasn't really working. And what we did was we, we went through the process of uh, interviewing and surveying their very best donors and um, found out that their, their donors uh, were really into celebrity and uh, also were really into um, saving money, um, but getting getting good deals. Um, also, their their values were around looking good, being seen to to other people, to be kind and generous. And so we tested a number of different sign up mechanisms. Um, just as Claire was saying, um, uh, we you know you need ideally you want to test between three and five. Generally, my clients are on the smaller side with fewer resources, and so. Uh, and I, I much prefer working with clients who have uh, are on the smaller side of fewer resources. And um, so we tested three different sign up mechanisms. Um, one was a um, signing up to be a dementia champion. And uh, another was um, signing up to get a discount on the Brace Alzheimer's Christmas cards. And uh, what we found was that the Christmas cards discount code, uh, codes went like hotcakes. And um, for the first time in years, they, they experienced a sudden surge in list growth. And that was because the sign up mechanism that we tested really, really uh, just fit in with the values of the people who were giving to them already. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> so um the third step in unlocking your giving code is to create compelling appeals and um the most compelling kind of appeals the ones that are just like gorgeous glazed donut in a box just waiting to be plucked um, those appeals will push the emotional buttons of new supporters by appealing to their values and motivations. So uh, in the book, I talk about three different values groups. I'm very into the research of a guy called Shalom Schwartz, who for many decades uh, every year would run the global human values survey and he would send researchers into dozens of different countries uh, and interview people with um, different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, uh, different um, levels of income and would ask them about what they value in life. And the result is this kind of map of different human values and those kind of cluster together in three different groups um, that I label Hobbit, Dwarf and Elf. Um, it's something I keep coming back to in the book. Um, so if you haven't read it yet uh, and uh, you, you enjoy Tolkien, uh, there's an incentive. Um, I did work with a client who um, was not a Tolkien fan, so we um, reached to Star Trek for uh, equivalent races, and we found that um, Bajorans, Ferengi, and humans matched the um, Hobbits, Dwarves, and Elves races quite neatly in terms of values. So if you're a Trekkie, there you are. There's alternative terminology for you. So... Um, how this worked for Unlock Democracy. This You can see the screenshot is a, a moment in time from their testing where they were testing the, the values of their audience. And you can see how they're using the elf, dwarf and hobbit terminology. So they tried two different versions of an image and they tried two different versions of the language to go along with that image, which appealed to different values. And you can see how all the costs per link click are incredibly low. Um, 
startlingly low for for Facebook. These these results are um, way out of the ordinary, and um, this this meant that the, the these low costs meant that they were getting new supporters for, um, you know, nearly um, forty p. I think um, people were joining their email list uh, at that cost. And um, what, but what you can see is that um, there is a fifty percent difference actually between the cost of one values group and another. So um, you can see how the the lowest cost link click, the six p, belongs to the dwarves group, the dwarves values group. <clears throat> and um, oh, I think we have a question. Hey, yes, we do. A uh, question from uh, the user account is Justice in Motion. I'm not sure the name of the person behind that, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how do you best find out about your donors, their values, interests, etc.? Do you send a survey? If so, what questions might be useful to gather that information? Or is there a better way of doing it? Okay, so um, great question. And the answer is, as you would expect, in the Giving Code book. Um, and it's page if you go to page one four one. Uh actually no one four five. Um the way you can find it is you can see that there's a um a champagne glass. I don't what do they call it a champagne dish or something? Champagne saucer, that's the one. Um so um it over those few pages, it will tell you how to run donor research interviews. And the good news there is you only need to do six of them. Um, and then um, the, uh, the next thing you need to do is run a survey. And um, there's guidance in the book as to what, what questions to ask, because um, it's very easy to get a survey wrong by asking hypothetical questions. <clears throat> there is a use to that, but if you really want to discover uh, more about your very best donors, then um, that's the point of the exercise. Then it's not a good idea to ask about, um, you know, if you saw this, would you do this or would you give in future? Um, because pe human beings are terrible at predicting their future behavior. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's only over a few pages. It's a really quick guide, but if you if you read it and follow it step by step, you should be able to um, come up with the um, the values and motivations of your very best donors in exactly the same way that Unlock Democracy have done. Um, and uh, yes, thank you for giving me a wonderful leading question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Claire is uh, backing me up on uh, how human beings are terrible at predicting their future behavior. Um, uh, as, as anyone who's made a New Year's resolution can tell you, uh, we, we just don't do it very well. Um, so essentially, um, Unlock Democracy realised that the values that they were appealing to previously were different than the values held by their very best supporters. And uh, although the, the price amounts seem quite small between these different groups, actually the, the cost difference between 6p and 10p, if you multiply that up over thousands of supporters, thousands of supporters is, is really big. Um, and um, this is what it translated into in terms of their unrestricted income, um, particularly their income from direct debits and memberships. So this figure just covers their income from um, from people, individuals who give regularly. And so before working with me specifically to find their giving code, um, their total unrestricted income was 132,000. And then the latest results we have for their financial, for their um, income figures uh, go up to 2022. And so we don't yet have the figures for 2023 that would show us the full extent of the increase in their 
unrestricted income that they got from unlocking their giving code. Um, but basically, it had grown by um, nearly fifty thousand um, pounds over the over the year, um, and and they're not done yet. They they, they haven't yet um, got through all of the steps in unlocking their giving code. Um, they're still only halfway through, really. Um, so there's still a lot of growth that they can unlock. And by repeating the process over and over, they can exponentially grow their unrestricted income. So just to summarize that for you, uh, the, the, the steps to unlocking your giving code are finding the right audience, the right message and the right channel, building a sign up mechanism that works while you sleep, um, making appeals that speak to your very best donor's values and motivations. And then the one that I haven't talked about yet, but I didn't have time for, but I still have more recent wins on um, to explain soon, watch this space, is to build forever loyalty. So um, that's it. Uh, if you've got any questions, please, please put them in the chat. And uh, we'll we'll run this until ten past three, and then we'll move on to doing some fun networking for introverts. We have a, a question from Nadra, which is, "How much was the spend between the two years?" Be interested to know what the ROI was in the example. Mm, great question. Um, I don't actually have the information on total spend from unlock democracy but i do know that the um they were getting between 40p and 90p per email list sign up and that's how much they were spending so um generally i uh, and, and unlock democracy are no different um generally a good rule of thumb to work out what your return on investment will be is that you can often raise one pound per appeal per list subscriber. So um, you the, the 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 return on investment is basically in a lot of ways up to how many appeals you do per year and how many people you can convert from cash gifts to regular gifts. So people who give one offs to people who um, give by direct debit or give as you earn or, or what have you. Um, we've got a few more. Yeah, so um, just to answer Gemma's question, yes, we are recording. So um, presumably we can, we'll can share that afterwards, Rachel, is that correct? That's right, yes, yes. Great. And another question from Carl, which is, do you have examples of sign-up mechanisms that work while you sleep? Uh, yes, there are tons and tons. Um, I think, uh, again, on page... You'd think if you wrote a book, you would know what everything is off by heart, but I, j I just don't. <laughs> Memorising page numbers is a bit is a bit much, though. <laughs> True. So page one six eight. Um, there's a by no means exhaustive, but um, fairly fairly comprehensive list of examples that you can use to get yourself thinking. Um, there. Uh, so you know, there's about. 16 to 20 different examples in there um, but there are there are many more and people are inventing new ones all the time so if you go through the brainstorming process once you've established the values of your very best donors then uh, you can try and come up or pinpoint ones that match those values and motivations we have another one through from Florence. So you mentioned building forever loyalty, and this is something we're looking into with our supporters at the moment. Do you have an example or tips on making supporters feel valued? And what kind of questions should we ask to find out how we can make them feel valued and ultimately donate again? Ooh, oh, wow. What a juicy question. I could I could do a whole, whole uh, presentation just on this. And uh, actually, you know, you've given me an idea that I might just do that. Um, do you have any examples or tips on making supporters feel valued? I think um, I think the um, the it, it really depends on their values. 
Um, and, and I say this because some donors will feel valued if you big them up and you share with the world how awesome they are. So, you know, you, you profile the best ones on Twitter and you say, this person is amazing. Look at this person. Um, but for some, uh, so for, for the people who fall into the values category of dwarves, uh, that that would be uh, just like that would make their month if that happened to them. Whereas for people in the values category of hobbits, that would be an absolute worst nightmare. That would be a horrible thing for them to have happen to them. They would not like that one bit and probably neither would elves. So um, you, you really need to understand exactly what makes them tick. And so, yes, that's where the, um, you need to ask questions. And uh, so there's essentially um, three three steps um, that I, I walk you through in the book. Um, so the first one is to do do in-depth donor research interviews. Um, the second is to do a donor research survey. And um, the, the final one is, and this is the most important one, is to test your findings on Facebook. So test different messages, messaging types. So create ads on Facebook that embody the values that you want to test that you've established from your donor research interviews and, um, and, and see which one wins. And then, um, so your, uh, the, and the, the results you get will give you a good guide to how to make those people feel, feel valued because, um people what what people what motivates people to do things um is is often the same thing as what makes them feel valued so um uh i value i value generosity so if someone is generous to me i will feel incredibly valued so um that obviously you can't go giving money to your donors. But if you find out that your donors value magnanimity and generosity, you you might write them a personal card and uh, put a personal message in that card to say um, how generous they are. Um, so that that's just one example, but it really, really it, it absolutely key to understand your donors before you go about doing that. Um, but ultimately, um, any any kind of personal contact is uh, it will will work with most people no matter what their values. Are you taking more questions or moving into the next section? Because we do have one. Uh, I think we yeah I think we do need to move into the next section because we've we've only got fifteen minutes left. Um, but before we do, very very importantly, um, Florence says I personally love writing our donors handwritten cards and. Uh, I just want to give you a chef's kiss for that because that's that's just the business in terms of uh, looking after your donors. So um, what I would like you to do, everyone, is go to this URL, uh, whisper.isc forward slash networking. And um, this is going to sound quite bizarre, but uh, you're going to see a, a Google Sheet. And um, so just click on the link. I'm just waiting for people to hear. So when you click on that link, um, you should see a picture of uh, one of my favorite networking spaces in Clark and Well, which is where I really wish we were doing this. And um, the way the way this works is that um, there are a number of different rooms. Um, there's six different rooms here that you can choose to go into. 
and um, feel free to leave your coat and bag in the cloakroom. Um, help yourself to uh, any of the uh, the free refreshments in in the uh, dining room, and then we'll kick off our networking exercise in the main event. <laughs> we also have a beach, which was suggested to me just today. Um, because everyone's, you know, winter's drawing in, it's kind of dark and cold. People might be longing for a little bit of a, a breather and a rest and recharge. And so if you're not really feeling like doing any networking and you just want to be quiet, um, you can head to the beach. Um, I don't know if people are actually, I'm not seeing any um, any visitors to the, uh, the link. I don't know if people are having problems. I can see about 12 people, 13. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Amazing. Amazing. It's not coming up on mine for some reason. Um, mine wasn't displaying until I made the window bigger. It was... Uh, ah, it. okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to repost the link. Oh, Danny's already done it. Amazing. Thank you. So... Um, so I'm going to move to the main event tab. And the idea is that we have uh, four different unfinished sentences uh, on the left-hand side. And um, what I'd like you to do is pick one that you most want to talk about and uh, just finish it off. So. I'll give you an example to start with. Um, okay, so I've I've finished off a sentence in one cell for you as a, a guide, and then um, once you've once you've done that, the next step is to look at others' finished sentences and see if there is one that you can respond to, and then put that put your response in the corresponding cell under under number two, the number two column there, and hopefully we'll trigger off some interesting contacts between different people. Um, as uh, a great, really great one already. One thing that I've learned this year that I'd love to share is your audience is not like you and what you like and find interesting isn't what they would find interesting. So spot on. So I will I will mute myself and let everyone um, type away merrily and um, then we will uh, we'll come back together uh, at uh, Oh, it's only it's only going to be eight minutes, <laughs> but three twenty-five.
Okay, so it's 3.25. Uh, time to time for us all to wrap up. Um, as a, a final a final gift, um, I would I would very I'm sure all of us would very much appreciate it if you could go to the feedback room and um add add in responses to any of those questions in the feedback form you want to respond to. It's completely anonymous. No one will know who put what. Um and um yeah, I'm glad to see already that people are enjoying the introverted networking. Um, and uh, as you're doing that, um, I will just uh, read out some things from the um, one thing I've learned this year that I'd love to share, um, because there's people have put some amazing comments in there um, uh, that one person needs to be brave and step into new spaces. And um, that's uh, that's very much my values, actually. Um, I find it very important to do things that scare me. Um, I think that it, uh, it, the kind of amazing life experiences that result are, uh, well, make it well worth doing, conquering your fear. And um, another comment, keep testing, even if it doesn't work, you've learned what works and what doesn't work. And that's still a useful insight. Yeah, really important. Um, it's just sweet to see someone saying how wonderful our supporters are, that they, they've they learned that, that this year. Um, that's just delightful. Um, there are more people for us than are against us to believe in ourselves and press forward in sharing our story. So, so true. It's it's hard to remember sometimes when people who are against you are so vocal, um, but it's amazing how just a small crowd of people can make a humongous amount of noise and how um, often most of the good people are just getting on with their lives. Um, and so, yeah, they, uh, the often more often than not, uh, the majority of people are for you. Um, uh, another thing that someone's learned that they want to share is uh, the digital platforms come and go, X, threads, etc. So make sure you build your own email list where you have more control. And someone else put a plus one on that. And I, I would add my plus one. Well, I would add a plus thousand to that. Um, yeah, make sure you collect data about your very best supporters that you own and you control. Um, and that doesn't only just apply to email addresses, it applies to phone numbers as well. And um, yeah, if, you, if you're inviting people to sign up for WhatsApp, um, that means that you get their phone number as well. So uh, WhatsApp is, is one to watch. I think uh, it's underutilized, I find, by, uh, by non-profits. Um, so please, please keep your feedback coming in. Um, and um, thank you also to whoever put the uh, the, the Barbie meme into onto the beach. <laughs> it's just that uh, that really tickled me. Um, okay. Um, Claire and Danny, please please come back if you've got any parting words you want to say. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Rachel, for having us. This has been uh, really nice to to be with you all. I know we're we're virtually together in the group, but still, uh, it's a really nice group. And always happy to hear more about the book. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a physical copy next time I can. Okay, so um, for people who are watching this on the recording, if you want to try out the networking for introverts, uh, you can still do that. Uh, it's freely available for anyone who's watching this recording. And you just go to whisper.ist forward slash networking, whisper.ist forward slash networking. And um, you two can participate just as if you were here right now. Um, so yes, um, thank you so much to everyone who came and supported this event and support the book. Um, please, please, if you've read it, 
give it to someone else because uh, the the sector needs to um, needs more skills and the type of uh, the type of information in the book is not well known. So um, a lot of it is very new and the sector needs to hear it. So um, please please share it around. I'd be very happy for you to do that. Um, thank you very much to to more onion for coming along and supporting and supporting the book. Um, it was yeah, it's been uh, really vital. Um, yeah, well, um, have a, a a fun rest of your afternoon, everyone, and um, I'll see you all soon. Enjoy the book. Oh, we have a uh, one very important question. Paid for the physical copy of the book, but nowhere in the sign up process asked for an address to send it to. Oh, that's embarrassing. Okay. Um, uh, Stuart, please uh, please email me with your um, your physical address and uh, I will get one off to you right away. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Well, cheerio, everyone. Everyone, take care.